Uh, you know, on a day like this, you should be out there enjoying a National Trust property somewhere. So, um, so thanks for thanks for the intro. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, yes, the cultural change, but also how you've got to do that in conjunction with all the other stuff, um, because uh, for me, it's not a do one, not the other. You've got to do all of it, and and this concept of where traditionally things used to, used to have a sort of um, a zero sum game where if you did something with security it meant you lost something on performance that actually we've got to get beyond that and change that conversation so that it's a, a win-win situation for security and for um, performance for example. So what is the National Trust? Um, for those of the uninitiated in the room who aren't fortunate enough to be members, um, we're, we're the largest UK independent um, conservation charity. Uh, you know we, we've been around for approximately 125 years and the click has stopped working there we go and our mission hasn't really changed in all of that time you know um, what's better on a sunny afternoon the picture of three long dead Victorians but the concept these people had about getting people out of the cities and engaging with outdoor places and historical places hasn't changed in all of that time and that's still what we're about today the challenge is more people want to do it and perhaps in the days when they were, you know, the challenge was getting them there. Now the challenge for us is how do you manage, you know, upwards of five and a half million members, 25 million paying visitors and, you know, anywhere up to, um, you know, a sort of a huge number of non-paying visitors. This is what we look after. Um, large parts of the, um, uh, the countryside. We're, we're also the single biggest farming organisation in the UK, um, you know, with the... Uh, a lot of the, the work we do with hill farming and stuff like that. We look after huge parts of the coastline. It's about the 15% most accessible coastline anywhere in the UK. Um, we don't look after Scotland, so you know, they have their own National Trust for Scotland. Um, lots of historical houses, gardens, collections, museums, pubs. That's my favourite bit. Uh, 60 of those. And even two gold mines. Who knew? Um, what else? This clicker is really annoying. Um, as I said, you know, five and a half million members, but also up to about 200 million non-paying visitors every year. People who just want to go and enjoy the lakes and, you know, places like that. We do have a lot of volunteers, about 70,000 of them, about 15,000 staff as well. And all of that equates to a lot of information to look after. OK, and we as an organisation, you know, are, do come across, uh, you know, significant threats to our information. So we have to protect it. We have to do it in a way that, that means something to the organisation. And this is what, you know, when, when we talk about risk and what the risk is to if you know, for personal data and all this type of thing, and I start talking about malware and things like this and threats to boundaries and all of this, my board is just completely over their head. They haven't got a clue what I'm talking about because to them, this is risk. It's big old historical properties that are a risk of something like this. Um, this is Clandon Park and this, you know, to my board and trustees, this is what they really understand about risk is this sort of big event. So how do we tell a story around cyber and security and data protection risks that isn't quite in the context of, you know, all the time it's that sort of big bang terrible thing, we're going to lose all of the data in a talk talk fashion and the, the, the chief exec is going to be on the news. Although, you know, we do have those conversations and have actually run through a full rehearsal um, of that type of activity with them, just so that it doesn't come as a terrible shock and they are practiced in that type of uh, response. Try pointing at the laptop. Um, this is another thing about language. So I remember when we were, we were doing a lot of work, does everyone remember the predecessor to Privacy Shield with Safe Harbor? And um, I was doing a piece about, you know, we had all of our volunteer data was actually hosted out in the US and we were talking to them about Safe Harbour and everything. Again, they're looking at me and saying, well, why are you talking about St. Michael's Mount? <laughs> yeah, and because that is what is known as Safe Harbour. And so, you know, getting that language right and really being clear on what we mean is hugely important. You've also got to do it in the context of what is achievable in the organisation. Okay, so a lot of our, our organisations are very much a devolved model and people out in the regions, out at the properties, they look after what they need to look after. And what they don't necessarily need is huge 
reams of information from the centre about you must do that, you must do this, because this is the type of context they're operating in. This is a place called Bransdale in the North York Moors, and, and Bransdale is basically the central valley of the North York Moors that we look after. It's a farming valley, okay? And so when we're talking about changing the culture of an organisation to one that really thinks about data protection privacy, they're thinking in this type of context, what the heck does that mean to us? Anyone who's a communicator, by the way, and wondering why is the satellite dish in with the chickens, is because they put it on the roof and it blew off, um, because it does get a bit rough up there in the winter. So getting the organisational context right is really important. Does anyone know who this is? Yeah. Babbage. Okay, this for me is the sort of technology we should be thinking about conserving in the National Trust, but because I've worked with thousands of people who like looking after old stuff, you just have to look at some of our laptops and you know, open up one of our data centers and you'll see equivalents of this, where people almost wear it as a badge of honor. Let's keep this old bit of kit running as, possibly, you know, as long as we possibly can. And every organization, perhaps not to the same extreme, faces challenges around legacy technologies in this way. And what do you do about them? Because quite often they are the things that present the single biggest security risk for us because we can't just apply a sticking plaster patch to it. Um, you have to really think about what are we going to do with this? Can we afford to migrate away from it? So big challenges on that side of things. And then of course there's our old friend GDPR. Okay, so there are two things about this. Firstly, GDPR tells us we have to do this. So for the first time ever, we're actually, it's mandated that we must do this stuff. Okay, and we have to implement data protection by design and by default. Article 5, 25 rather, GDPR makes that abundantly clear. So what does that mean for us? It means for the first time, we have got levers that we can pull that says, you must put in place the appropriate technical and organizational measures in order to implement those data protection principles, one of which is obviously the information security principle. And you have to implement those safeguards so that we can meet all of those demands and make sure that we look after and protect people's rights. Okay. And it then goes on to tell us, okay, what does that mean? We have to think about it from the very start of any processing activity. So the point in time when someone has that great idea that's the cultural shift that we have to achieve. It says, well, what about the data protection implications of that? What about the privacy implications of this? And that's a big cultural shift. And the way that we've started to tackle that, we've, we implemented a, um, a program called Privacy in Our DNA. And basically, it was a slow trickle, constantly telling people about why this stuff is important, making people do e-learning. I'm sure you all do that. But then doing focused training and interventions on certain groups within that community. Does anyone have a marketing department here? Are there a nightmare to you in all things data protection but also in delivering technology? Because why would you bother going through IT when you can get your credit card out and go and buy software as a service? Yeah? We've all had those challenges of shadow IT within our organizations. Why? Because the people selling this stuff, they know that you know, they're an easy target. And why would you go through all of that assurance function of an IT department when you can go straight to the person with the credit card? It causes us great problems. So that to me, straight away, I've got a target for my intervention and training. So you look for the worst offenders and then get them to start fixing this stuff themselves. But also, you know, it means that, so data protection by design, there's two halves to it. There's the design bit so how do you actually implement it for any new IT service, any new change to organizational policies, procedures, data sharing initiatives, any new use of personal data, marketing initiatives, business activities, doesn't matter. And what we've um, done is actually changed both our project management framework, but also our marketing um, framework, uh, changing our approvals process and the finance system, to actually give us all of these things that says you must go and speak to the data protection office before you do anything. Yeah, and giving people the awareness so that they can start implementing these solutions themselves and building their own solutions. Because that's the, you know, ultimately that's the goal is getting all of your teams away from your data protection office function to actually solve these problems themselves and starting thinking that. And that to me is when you've actually made the cultural shift 
Okay. This week I had a, a conversation with um, the two guys who run our imagery. Yeah, they, they run the sort of photography profession and the trust. And for some reason over the course of the last um, two or three months, they've, I've always seen them daily, you know, coming around IT, talking to the data protection office. And these are the same people that I had to, you know, wrestle uh, into a corner to, to understand why they were using their own iPads and I, you know, Macs and all of this because you couldn't possibly use standard IT equipment for, for doing this. And all of a sudden, they're the leading light on data protection throughout the organization. Why? Because the penalty, penny finally dropped to them that they could use this as a lever to professionalize photography within the trust and say, okay, you can't take pictures of people without model release forms. You can't utilize them. And actually at the same time say, well, wouldn't it be great if while we're training our photographers about doing that, from a privacy perspective, we also up their game and taught them how to take pictures properly. So they utilizing this change in the legislation to actually get their agenda fulfilled. So part of that we saw is, okay, there's, there's something in this. So how do we identify or work with the areas of the business and I put a business analyst onto this to say, what is the lever that they're looking for that they might possibly get some benefit out of this approach? And then you explain that to them and as I say with these two guys, all of a sudden they become the greatest champions of GDPR across the organisation. They couldn't spell it um, a few months earlier. So that's changing the culture. By default, um, really is the start of the process for understanding making privacy a default setting in everything that we do. So making sure that people you know, minimize the amount of information they collect, that we're really transparent on how we're going to use people's information and tell people about it, using technologies like encryption and the other one that I can't pronounce, um, and making sure that we absolutely both identify but then adhere to a retention schedule. Because most of the things I've come across in the past, I say, well, what's the retention schedule on this? And people will rattle off a date, you know, so it's two years. When was the last time you che checked? The information, never, yeah. But the question mm. you prompted there, John, is, is in selling this activity, yeah. do you lead with the compliance, we've got to do this because the, it's the law? No. Or, or do you lead with the what's in it for you? But yeah, so, so I actually, something else, we say that, you know, this is about um, respecting people's information in the same way that you would want your own to be respected. It's about applying common sense. It's about looking after stuff because in, in my particular organization, one thing that very, people are very good at is looking after stuff. And so actually you know, explain to them that simple terms is in the same way as you look after this old book or piece of artwork or this you know, creature or plant or whatever it is, you're just looking after people's information. And, and understanding that what respect for that information actually means. And a lot of the time, in, the problem is they don't actually understand what is meant by that privacy requirement. And, and that that's shouldn't be surprising to anyone, because one thing that we've never had in this country is a threat to our privacy in the same way. Yeah, because you know, if, you, if you look at where all this stuff is based in, in the European Convention of Human Rights, 1950, way back when you know Europe is coming out of the back end of the Second World War most of the countries have either had some sort of direct occupation by Nazi Germany you know fascist Italy you've got a fascist regime in Spain you've then got the communist regimes all across Eastern Europe and then you've got Britain yeah and they didn't experience any of that I mean some people would argue that Margaret Thatcher came a little bit closer in the late 70s early 80s but you know you've got none of that and so we have not got a culture of privacy in the UK. I was at a, a talk with the Information Commissioner um, back about a year ago, saying that the only time the British people really get excited is when they realise they've lost something. <laughs> yeah? And they realise that their privacy rights have actually been abused by you know, some of the big companies out there that were in the news a lot at, those at that time. But right up to that point, they're not interested. Couldn't care less. But if you go to a lot of... Other countries throughout Europe where a lot of this stuff has its roots, they really do care about this because they know what it's like to not have it. Yeah? And I think it's a really important cultural difference between the UK and I think that's perhaps why 
it's been quite difficult to land GDPR um, in, in the UK context. Um, there are models. This, this is a, a simple framework. It's actually a Deloitte framework. It's based on the uh, privacy by design that the, um, the Canadian Information Commissioner came up with way back 20 plus years ago. Yeah. And if you look through GDPR, all it is about is implementing this type of thing. Okay, understanding what end-to-end -end security means from the moment you collect something right the way to the when you securely dispose of it. Yeah, respecting user privacy, keeping that at the centre of everything you do. Embedding privacy into the design so it's the default setting. You don't have to change things to make it private or make it secure. Okay, so this is nothing new. It's a very simple seven-step model that you know if, if, if you look at actually really helps you think. And, and when you start to embed it, and I'll talk through some, some other parts now, it actually can save you a whole heap of money because it changes the way that you approach some of these things. And actually getting those solutions in place from the start actually can save you a whole heap of hassle trying to bolt them on or do assurance after the fact. Yeah, and certainly if, um, you know, I, I tend not to talk about fines and things like that because you know, great, we've all had the big scary numbers around 4% of, of um, global annual turnover and, and, and so on and so forth. But realistically, is that, is that the sort of game that we think the regulators are in? You know, even with the, the big um, uh, issue that the French regulator had with Google, was it 55 million euros? How much of that has actually been paid? Go on, who's going to have a guess? Absolutely zero. And why is that? The Court. Absolutely. And where's Google's base likely to be? Is it going to be in France going forward? Yeah. Or is it going to be in Ireland maybe? Yeah. So these are the challenges that actually trying to implement fines of scale, which are would potentially be organization breaking levels of fines, you know, that, that it, it's not really so what is realistic and getting that conversation right, I think, you know, is, is really important in this because if you make the fear uncertainty and doubt unrealistic for a board then they're not going to change their behaviors because they just think you know it's uh, never going to happen um there are certain times obviously when we say you know that it's mandated that we must do these things the data protection impact assessments for example um the european uh, um, data protection board though recently said that actually a lot of countries are being too specific too rigid when you do these Part of our cultural shift that we try to do is say to people, actually, you make this as easy as possible to do, yeah, and, and a data protection impact assessment. All it is about increasing awareness, implementing data protection by design, understanding how we're going to protect people's interests and reducing any negative impact on those, improving transparency, building trust and engagement, implementing a simpler and less costly solution. What is there in there that anybody in an IT organisation wouldn't want to do? Realistically. Yeah. And so actually just saying to people, this is what it's all about. So why don't you do that with every single information service that you deliver? And that's what we've done. And we said that, you know, as, as, a, as a matter of course, we have a very simple four step process. We do some screening. Yeah. And this is with suppliers. It's with, with we're building our own services, everything. If that is flagged as a high risk, those are the ones we focus on straight away. And that, that screening process is three simple questions about are you processing personal data? If so, how much? If so, is there any special category data? And if the answer is yes to any of those, you go into a data protection impact assessment process. First one, a recording process. All this is, is the requirements everyone has in Article 30 GDPR. It says you must record the processing activity. So actually, you're doing that, all you're doing is, is tick, you've done your accountability piece, okay? Then some sort of, we call it a DPO initial assessment, it's, a, it's an automated assessment that says, is this a high, medium or low risk? You just use a standard probability impact um, scoring and off you go. And if the answer is high and some medium, it goes through a full DPIA process. And actively all that does is bring it into an active risk management process. We've also implemented uh, a strategic design authority to actually bring these risks up to the highest level in the organization and implementing that for the first time an enterprise architecture. 
Okay? And what that means is that we are able to link everything that we do from the information, the technology infrastructure, the lot, right the way up to the business processes. Okay? And understand those data flows throughout all of that. We've also introduced DevOps uh, into all that we do. It's actually, I know some people refer to it as DevSecOps, but you know, embedding information assurance processes within that DevOps function. So changing our portfolio delivery teams into ones who actually own the operational services now. Okay, and for some of those, it's more advanced. We've been doing it for a long time in digital, um, less so in some of our more traditional ERP solutions. But now we've started to embed that way of working throughout the organization. And a very simple operating model that says that how we engage with people, how we then make change, how we operate and continuously improve what we do for everything around this assurance with it, you know, embedded within this assurance framework to make sure that as we make that cultural shift and say everyone has to do this, that we actually then check that people have done it. Yeah? And so we've got those checks and balances throughout everything that we do. We've also um, realigned ourselves as part of our transformation, and, I, and I, I don't want to use the organizational design piece here, but effectively by saying these are the business units that know what they want to achieve in terms of business outcomes. And all we've done is given them ownership of all of the IT delivery within those portfolios. And saying, so therefore you've got complete alignment between what's the usage, what's the the thing that's driving this data protection challenge right the way through to the technology infrastructure that's below it. And so this idea about you know, marketing going off and doing their own thing, they don't need to now because they've got their own delivery vehicle through IT to do that for them. And those old barriers about, well, I can't get my thing done, we break them down by actually making them accountable for it and implementing product owners in every single one of those business units Um, I'm not going to dwell on this, this is just our very simple model, you'll all have something similar. And just to really emphasise the point that fine putting this stuff at the, in at the get-go, but really understanding how it's got to continue to evolve over time if it's going to be successful. Also having defence in depth, so we put our critical data and systems right at the middle you know, of what we do, at the heart of what we do. Um, some people would say that's much just the target that everyone aims for, but then trying to protect those through our people, processes and technology and having then that onion layer approach to having many security capabilities to, um, to help us once those services are up and running. Implementing simple things as well, or simple things, there's nothing simple about this, I don't suppose actually, but um, Having a framework, and it doesn't matter which framework you choose, whether you're ISO 27000, CIS top 20 or whatever, it doesn't matter. The fact is you're actually thinking about and paying attention to everything that you're doing as an, as an organisation. So having a framework that you can actually test yourself against and not just be doing the old whack-a-mole of every time a new prob problem sort of uh, pops up that you have to do something about it. So choose your poison and off you go. This was a, a really interesting one that we did. Within our DevOps community um, for our digital services, we were doing, um, I think it was Renew Online. So if you're, if, when you join National Trust, which you can also do online, um, you decide to renew, was we gave, the developers were saying, well, how can we do this so it's compliant with data protection and blah, 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 blah. And, and in the end, I got so fed up of listening and arguing about this. So will you tell me, you solve it, yeah? And we also said, well, within, You've all got your OWASP top 10. You know within that that that's you know, the, the, the standards that we demand for you as developers. Start thinking more broadly about how do we minimize the amount of data to you. But don't focus on it from a data protection perspective. So back to this, it's not a zero sum game, performance and security and privacy, okay? I said to them, what would give you the best possible user journey in this, yeah? And approach the problem from that perspective. And where they came up with is actually, well, we only want to collect two fields of information, no more. And the reason being, that's the absolute minimum that we need, and therefore it's the best possible you know, user journey in order to renew as quickly as possible. So if you're like me, by the time I get to a third field in any form, I've, I've got bored. And so, you know, actually just giving it back to the developers 
they came up with the answer. Yeah. So really, that's what I mean about changing that culture to get them to solve this problem for you. And then actually monitoring what you've then done. So it's fine saying we're going to embed security and data protection and everything that we do. But if then you've not got visibility on everything that you're doing, how do you know? Yeah, and there's an old adage about what gets measured gets done. I think in information security that really is the case. One of the challenges you have here though is that there are so many tools and technologies out there. I mean, quite to go and have a talk with some of our partners out there um, today that you need security operators who've got at least 10 sets of eyes because they're looking at so many different tools. So how do you bring that into a single dashboard that will tell you enough and give you that enough level of assurance within your security operations? And then, yeah, do, do be wary. If anyone tells you there's an easy solution to this, um, look to the right-hand side. Uh, if anyone tells you that this is an easy fix, then you're kidding yourself, yeah? It takes time, it takes a lot of time, and then it takes a bit more time to do. Um, you know, if you look at something like the CIS Top 20 and a realistic time frame to implement just the top five of that, yeah, you're talking about a couple of year program. Um, so, and depending on what your organization is, you know, maybe you haven't got quite as many um, built by Charles Babbage machines as we have, but uh, there you go. I think that's it. Run out of time. Yeah, you're fine. Am I? Yes. I don't know if, uh, <laughs> if there's any questions on any of that or about anything else, about how to join the National Trust online. Yeah? Go online. Hey. Yeah? Go online, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> Made by direct debit to the cheaper. Yeah. Yes. Seriously, are there any questions for, uh, for John? Does that ring true with any of your organisations? How about what's next? Yeah. What's next for you? Um, making it stick yeah. is, is the, the, the ultimate test in all of this. So, you know, it's fine you've implemented all of this thing. Then getting it to sort of, you know, just run itself, that's the, that's the biggest challenge. I mean, I, I don't know about you guys, but we've had to significantly upgun our data protection office and information assurance team to deal with the demands of GDPR. Um, you know, I, I think... Last time I measured, we've got a 4,700% increase in access requests or uh, rights to be forgotten being executed. Yeah, um, It's absolutely eye-watering amount of work. To go from a standing start, you know, we used to run the old privacy impact assessments on this stuff, but to now to make this mainstream around all new suppliers, all new business activities and what have you, it does become a bit of an industry. And that's why... You know, we try to simplify it as much as we possibly can. Um, but, you know, also simplifying our supplier base. So we have 28,000 suppliers in our supply chain, you know, some of whom are, uh, you know, a, a very specialist who will do some sort of conservation work, right through to the likes of, you know, BT and Microsoft and others. So uh, that, that's a huge challenge. I think supply chains probably, I really you, you know. Not exact work with action for children. It's, mm -hmm. it's not just inside; it's the the supply chain. It is the technology supply chain. Yeah. In our world, action for children. There's all the safeguarding children stuff as well. Yeah. It's really, really important. It is, and we have you know similar challenges with our volunteer community. You know, because a lot of our volunteers, um, yes. you know, uh, have got you know we have to work with them to make sure that those safeguarding measurements are in place. And it's um, yeah, it is. It's it's a challenge, but I think. You know, the, the likes of Microsoft or Google or all these, they've obviously got this stuff cracked. So they're not the ones I'm worried about. It's the small, medium size and micro size organizations who we want to work with. You know, ultimately, um, you know, we all want to encourage those people, especially and then things like innovation ideas to how do we encourage new technology suppliers to come into the market. But for them, this stuff isn't easy. And uh, so I think that's probably one of the biggest challenges. And we've actually started working um, and someone say, well, OK, we'll just give you some free top tips, you know, point you to some really clear resources that the ICO, the ICO, to be fair, I mean, I know they've come for a lot of stick over the last 12 months. There are some really fantastic free resources and advice um, out there, particularly for SMEs. I think, you know, the big organisations want to say, well, we want to know exactly what this, 
you know, this dot over this I means. Um, well, they're struggling there because nobody really knows that um, with, with a lot of the stuff within GDPR at the minute. But, you know, the advice for small, small organisations, medium-sized, I think it's really good. Mm.